with judicial review now we're gonna be looking at judicial review right as well as the doctrine of star well not sorry i'm sorry this is the doctrine of ultravirus then we'll look at natural justice right and then have a look at local standi all right so the principle itself judicial review is very is a fundamental principle mainly in legal systems right so it speaks to the fact that the judiciary has the authority to review the constant the constitutionality of le and legality of laws regulations and decisions made by public bodies so any decision made by any type of public body whether it be legislative executive anything like that if these decisions right are foggy right as it relates to our shaky as it relates to constitutionality and legality judicial review is there the power of the judiciary to review these issues right so that is what we're looking at judicial review and public authority we know that public authority refers to any government agents or departments or any body that exercises power or functions on behalf of the state so we're looking at these public authorities right Public authorities are bound by legal standards and procedures and their actions are subject to judicial review as well to ensure that they act within their legal authority. So for example, the police. They are given power by the state to actually exercise their, their power, right? Or their different functions, right? Their, their actions of the police can actually be um, submitted under, well, will they actually have to submit to judicial review, right? So if there are any type of issues with these public authorities, judicial review is also there in order to ensure that these legal authorities adhere to the rule of law, right? Judicial review and statutory authority, no. We know that statutory authorities speak to the people who have legislated for the legislature. So the laws passed by the legislature are there now, right? The functions, right, that the legislature, um, or the functions of the laws and the legislations right can actually obstruct right the constitution obstruct justice right so the judicial review is there to make sure that any type of law that is passed by parliament right or any actions done by these statutory authorities right are reviewed right so make sure they're trying to make sure that they are done through the right processes right and are within the right scope right within their separation of powers right to make sure that they're within the actual scope of power that they need to be in and to make sure that they're, they're not unconstitutional or illegal, all right? So looking at that, so judicial review versus appeal. So how is judicial review different from an appeal, all right? So we know that it involves the examinations of legality, procedural fairness, and adherence to legal standards, right? They can result in the nullification, amendment, or confirmation of an action or decision under review. And the focus on judicial review is one is on the legality and constitutionality of the decision making process itself rather than the merits of the decision. So we don't really care about the decision that much. Either. We're caring about whether or not the decision making process was constitutional or legal. Alright. The appeal now, we know that an appeal on the other hand now is a process by which parties right seek legal um parties in legal cases seek a review of the decision so appeals are more decision based more so that than the process of decision making right appeals typically focus on the errors of law whether or not they're per inquirium right the procedure procedural ultravarious are a fact that um a, um a law court made rather than the constitutionality of the law laws or the decision making process so they don't really focus on the constitutionality or focus that okay i had a decision i don't like a decision let's appeal that's different from judicial review the appellate court reviews the lower court's decision right to determine whether or not errors right um that occurred were well, well warranted a correction of some sort right or a reversal right so it can result in affirmation reversal or modification of the lower court's decision right but this is different. So appeal, appellate courts deal with appeals, right? The Supreme Court or the highest court in the land, whether it be privy courts, etc., actually deals with judicial review. So there are differences between the two. Ultravirus doctrine now. Could somebody explain to me what ultravirus is? What is it? Acting beyond the powers 
acting beyond the powers, okay? So speak about it a little bit more, discuss it. Okay, so somebody said in the chat, going beyond or exceeding one's powers, right? So we're going outside the scope that was provided by the constitution, right? So going outside your scope. Alright, so another answer in the chat to act outside your prescribed powers are located to a public body. Okay. Alright, could be a person as well. Well, the body of the person, okay? So looking at that. So let's look at this, right? That is um, generally what ultravirus is, right? So it can be procedural or substantive. Procedural ultravirus you now refers to the actions that are taken improperly or unlawfully. So it's so procedural ultravirus speaks to the fact that you are acting within your scope, but the procedure was wrong. The procedure was um, the procedure right, that you took failed to follow the correct procedures laid out by law. So the procedure is wrong. So that's why it's procedural ultravirus rather than substantive. With substantive now, we're just talking about the fact that you have acted beyond, beyond your authority. So substantive ultravirus is when you act outside of your scope and procedural ultravirus occurs where you act within your scope but wrong procedure. Make sense? Hopefully those differences make sense. Right. Unlawful acts no. Actions deemed ultravirus are typically considered invalid or unenforceable. The doctrine serves as a safeguard against the government well against government overreach and abuse of power by ensuring that public authorities operate within the bounds of legal authority. Right? So when institutions themselves, right, um are acting outside their prescribed scope specifically, right? It erodes public trust in government institutions, right? So you're doing what you're not supposed to be doing, or you're doing what somebody else should be doing. It erodes the public trust. Therefore, adherence to the doctrine of ultravirus is essential for maintaining the separation of powers, protecting individual rights, and upholding the rule of law. Okay? So remedies in administrative law. Breaches of fundamental rights. So look at the Inland Revenue Commissioner versus Leili Manardi. I want to look at Ramesh Maharaj versus the Attorney General of China and Tobago. We'll look at that. Alright? So breaches of fundamental rights actually um, are under judicial review. Do judicial, judicial review if there are any breaches, right? What happens if there's political victimization, abuse of power, or mala um, fide? Alright? What does mala fide speak about? What does that stand for? What does that mean? Anyone can tell me what does that mean? This term here. So it speaks to acting in bad faith. All right, so we have that there. What we're gonna have is all is AG versus um Lail, right? Nineteen ninety eight, Devant Maharaj versus the Statutory Authorities Service Commission, two thousand four as well. And if there is any breach in the provision of some statute other than the Constitution, all right, we have Majestan versus the Attorney General, nineteen sixty eight. So hopefully these these are present. Right, hopefully these make sense to you guys. All right. So with these remedies under the administrative law, I, I want to discuss at least one of these cases. Does anybody know one of these cases? Please discuss one. Sir, repeat. Please discuss at least one of the cases here. Anybody? Other than the ones that we discussed already, we discussed Maharaja and we discussed Inland Revenue Commissioner. So the one for I need one for political victimization, right? And one for the and I only have one here for breach of provision. So if anybody knows that case, go ahead. What's happening?
What is happening in this? So, no, 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 so only, only bridges are fundamental, right? Okay. Don't know those cases? Okay, 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 okay. Interesting. So, mm -hmm. you could speak about Devant Maharaj, right? So, what happened here now? We have um, some commissioners appointed somebody, right? Someone other than the applicant, right? Um, as a deputy director of the National Lottery Board. So looking at that, we're at, what happened here was the appointment, right? Of someone to a position, right? Other than the person who actually applied for it. The applicant had in fact been selected by the commission for the appointment, but the commission's consulted the prime minister who vetoed the applicant's appointment. There was no law requiring the commission to consult the prime minister, nor no one giving him the power to veto. The commission nevertheless accepted the veto. Procedural and substantive ultravirus. First of all, the process, the application process, right, to the commission, right, does not include talking to the prime minister or getting his confidence procedural ultravirus there right the con the prime minister vetoed the posi the the decision right the prime minister had no power to veto the decision substantive ultravirus so we're seeing the two different types of ultravirus going out there so and that's why i chose this case to discuss because two different forms of ultraviruses in this case right the commissioner's defense to the obligation the objection rather, of the prime minister was unlawful and the appointment of the other person was completely quashed, circulari, right? The courts remitted the matter to the commission and the reconsideration with an order that if it did not appoint the applicant, he should be appro um, provided within 14 days of the decision and the reasons in writing, right? So looking at that. Because you can't have somebody applying for something and then you accept somebody else that never even applied, that is not the applicant, right? And then you go to the Prime Minister and ask for the Prime Minister's um, blessing, which is not a part of your procedure. And then the Prime Minister continues to veto the decision, which is not in the power of the Prime Minister. These are all wrongdoing, right? Ultravirus everywhere. And this was in, in Malafide, uh, Malafide, right? In bad faith, right? So look at the abuse of power and political victimization there. Devant Maharaj versus Statutory Authority Service Commission, 2004. What was happening for the breach of the provision of some statute, so statute other than constitution? So yes, you can breach the constitution and judicial review can occur. But what happens if you breach another statute that is not the constitution? You can breach regular laws as well. Magistrate versus the Attorney General speaks to that, right? So looking at that. So the statute itself gave the governor, right, of Antigua the power to restrict any type of immigration. He used the power to regulate work permits. The act did not give him the power, right, to make work permit regulations. Listen closely. The act gave him the power to restrict immigration. It never gave him the power to regulate work permits. This is substantive ultravirus, right? The use of the you he used his power, right, um, beyond the purposes of the statute, and the regulations were ultravirus to the statute. That is Marjistan versus the Attorney General. Do you guys understand the cases? Because the cases are there for you to understand the concepts, you know. Do we understand the cases so far? Okay, at least we get I got one response. One person understands so far. Alright? And if I could assist one person, that is all the rage. Alright? So looking at that in Defant Maharaj, what we're looking at the, the, is uh, procedural ultravirus and substantive ultravirus. Alright? And we're looking at in Majistan is just substantive ultravirus. Alright? So looking at that. Additional grounds for judicial review. So there are other grounds for judicial review that are covered under natural justice. 
natural justice is a procedural fairness or procedural justice and it speaks to that it speaks to procedural fairness or procedural justice it's a legal principle that emphasizes the importance of fairness impartiality and equity in decision making right i'm gonna look look at the fairness that is exacerbated within these different areas of natural justice so it seeks to uphold the rule of law by ensuring that decisions are made in accordance with established legal principles and without bias or prejudice all right so the natural justice is important for several reasons all right so looking at the three well looking at the several reasons and then the three pillars right so the protection of rights natural justice safeguards individual rights and liberties by ensuring the fair and transparent procedures there's also legitimacy and public confidence. So when there's fear and impartial decision making, it enhances the legitimacy of governmental institutions and foster public trust. Right? We also have the rule of law. Right? Natural justice is fundamental in upholding the rule of law, which requires that laws and decisions are applied consistently, predictably, and fairly. So these are the general importance of natural justice, All right? As it relates to the three pillars, there are three pillars that uphold natural justice. And these are the three pillars. The right to be heard, right? Audi alterum partem, right? The right to be heard, right? So it requires that individuals affected by a decision have the opportunity to present their case, the right to a trial. That is important under na under natural justice, right? The rule against bias. Decision makers must approach tasks with imp impartiality without bias or prejudice. They must have not. They must not have any personal interest or outcome in the matter, right? In the outcome of the matter, right? And they must disclose any potential conflicts of interest. So conflict of interest must be presented. The right to be re to a reasoned um, decision, right? Decision makers are required to provide reasons for their decisions. They can't just make a decision without a reason. You can't just enact law A just because you felt like it. There must be a reason why you enacted such a thing, right? So why did you fire somebody? There must be a reason for the firing. If it is not, it's unlawful removal of the person, unlawful firing, right? There must be a reason. Somebody applied for a position, you did, they did not get, get the position, right? If the person asks why they did not get the position after applying, right, you must provide a reason. There must be a reason for your decisions being made. These are the three different pillars that hold up natural justice. The right to be heard, the rule which is all the ex, um, alterum partem, right? The rule against any type of bias, right which prevents potential conflicts of interest and the right of a reasoned decision the right for the person to know the reasons why these decisions are being made these are the three pillars of natural justice right so the right to a fair hearing we know what that was about i just discussed it right not sure if anybody has any questions for this anybody has a question as it relates to the right of fair hearing or the right to a fair hearing Okay, so we're hearing no's. The cases, no, the right to be heard, the audio term partem, right? The cases that we're looking at here now is Booker versus Widow, right? And Hutchinson versus COP. Those are the two cases. So let's speak about Booker versus um, Widow, right? It's a very, very small case, right? So this is the case of a traffic commissioner, right? So he revoked a, bu he revoked a bus conductor's license without a hearing. That's the issue there. How can you revoke the person's license without a hearing? A magistrate would have convicted him right, of the offense of acting as a conductor of a, of a motor bus after his certificate right, as a conductor was revoked. So basically, what happened here? The conductor is there working, right? He's, not, he's, do, he's having the best time of his life doing his job. He woke up, went to work, everything all right. He got arrested. Right? And he was convicted by a magistrate. Right? Because his license was 
his license was revoked without a fair hearing, without a hearing at all. So how would he have known? This was completely stricken down. The re the revocation, right, of the license as well was given down, right. So the revo the revocation of the license was completely stricken down, and overturning the conviction was also given now. The conductor was um condemned without being given any opportunity to be heard right how can you re revoke the bus conductor's license without there being a fair trial without there being any type of understanding from him the right to be heard was infringed upon right so looking at that okay the same thing with suspension of license right occurred within hutchinson vcop right so the same type of issue here the right to give to be given particulars of the charge what's happening here now the right entails that individuals facing disciplinary or legal proceedings must be informed of specific allegations or charges against them right so you guys know miranda rights right it's similar to that of miranda rights it's not the same thing but it's similar to that of miranda rights right but the right the rights are read to you and then you need to be knowing you need to know you need to have some understanding of why you're being charged right so if you're going so looking at this right it allows them to understand the nature and scope of the case against them eat the person right prepare their defense efficiently or effectively and respond to the allegations in meaningful manner right you can't just convict a person or charge a person and you did not tell them why you're charging them no, cannot happen. It's like you push somebody into a police car and they ask what them do, and you look and you look at them face and shut the door. You don't tell them anything. Why are you being charged? You don't know. So they have a right to be given the particulars of their charge. Katuwaru versus Burroughs, nineteen eighty-two, and Blake and Emmanuel versus Barker, nineteen ninety-two. These are two instrumental cases. The Katuwaru case is about the firearm act. What's happening there? Does anybody know this case? Okay, so with this, I'm just going to explain Katuwaru as the main case here, right? So what occurred here, right? It's just remember cases are just there to explain things. Go ahead. Sir, couldn't you use the Maja versus A G case instead of those cases? The Maharaj case? Yes, sir. Yes, okay. So you can use that case, right? That's a lovely case to use the Ramesh Maharaj case. Right? But you know there are other cases and I like to give other cases, right? You can use the same case for everything. Well, not for everything here, but you know, you can use the same case for multiple things, right? But what happened here with the Katwari case, right? There was a firearms license given to a police officer, right? And the police officer went and bought a shotgun with the um, license, right? Sometime later, his license was cancelled, right? And he was detained by the police under the provisions of the Firearm Act, right? Say that the Commissioner of Police, right, may revoke any license in any case if he thinks it fit that was given under the Act. But here the here the issue now. The person was not given the reason for the cancellation. He didn't know why it was cancelled, right? And the commissioner did not grant him his request. The commissioner did not tell him why. He did not state the particulars of the charge. So we see that there's an issue there. There was a failure to uphold nat um, natural justice. So the revocation was void. The commissioner was ordered to return his license and his firearm back to the person. Can you never tell him why? That's how they lose their rights majority of the time, you know, right? He does have the power to do it. But he never told the person that you have a, that the reason why you were doing it, right? He never tell him, told him that, okay, under this act so and so, I do have the power to do that and that. You told him. But you you denied his request to know why he was being charged. Right? So that's an issue there. You have rules against bias as well. So we generally know biases specifically. Re a solicitor 
right and porter versus mcgill are the two main cases that we can see here with re a solicitor 1935 right a solicitor sat as a member of the disciplinary committee while a partner in his firm instructed the council on behalf of the committee the fees receivable right for the representation was for the firm not the partner right the relationship transgressed right and the rule against the um the, the rule was um we transgressed against the rule right against the um the bias that was there right because a partner from his own firm was advising the commission right so you remember what the about this partner committee right and you're a partner of the firm instructed the council right on the behalf of the committee right not the person on the committee no but a partner right so we're looking at the issues there right and looking at how that partner in the firm right because you have some amount of personal understanding with the person there's a conflict of interest there so we're just looking at how the conflict of interest arises within the re solicitor case right within porter v mcgill 2002 now what was happening there anybody knows what was happening there Okay, so a council member, Dame Shirley Porter, organized and ran a scheme in which public housing could be purchased by the residents of, um, for very low prices, right? In an effort to increase her chances of re-election. The houses were sold at a discount, which cost the city an estimated £31 million in losses. An auditor investigated and concluded that the scheme was illegal and Dame Shirley would face a possible fine of 31 million in personal liability if the investigation proved so. He stated as much as a press conference, um, as much in a press conference which he gave during the investigation, the question for the court right, was whether the resulting investigation decision should be quashed for apparent bias, right? decision would not be quashed lord hope then stated es established right um in his obita dictum right that whether the fair-minded or informed observer right having considered the facts would conclude that there was a real possibility that the tribunal was biased dame shirley was eventually fined as much a much smaller sum what we're saying is that the tribunal itself should have known that there was a clear bias in this issue, right? Looking at the fact that the constituents themselves were get, getting um, houses at a much lower rate in um, for chance of re-election, right? So what was happening here now, right? There was some amount of conflict, right? Bias, right? And um, bias as well as what we'd say, you know, conflict of interest, right? Because what we're looking at is a person that benefited from the general issue right being one of the persons that were on the opposite side of the general issue right so what we're looking at is that the person was selling the residents at low prices in um for re-election right and an auditor was being basically investigating whether or not right this issue was illegal whether or not the scheme was illegal right it was generally illegal you know right but looking at the entire system itself it was basically saying that any reasonable person would have considered the fact and would have already concluded that this was going to be that there was to be a real possibility that the tribunal was going to be biased right because what we're looking at you know is the tribunal of the city right of the board right being set up right and a lot of these residents were going to these persons so there would have been some bias eventually right so we're looking at the rule against bias there okay as for legitimate expectation we know what legitimate expectation speaks to it's a principle under administrative law that recognizes individuals rights to rely on promises or representations made by public authorities right so it it seeks to um create a clear and, and um well it seeks to create 
um, some amount of ease within the legal process when there is clear or an, an ambiguous promise or representation right, to an individual. Right? So if there is any reason to believe that something is going to be upheld, then it should be upheld. Right? So we're looking at stuff like that. The principle ensures that public authorities act fairly and, in, and consistently in their dealings, right? So we're looking at that. So there should be um, generally, right, um, reliance of individuals on these public authorities to be consistent, unambiguous, and clear, right? So we're looking at the legitimate expectations here. We can use AG of Barbados versus Joseph and Boyce, or if we use Marx v. Minister of Home Affairs. Right? Any one of them you can use for legitimate expectation. Alright? So, Marx versus Minister of Home Affairs, I would recommend for legitimate expectation we use that case. Right? Primarily. Alright, so if you guys need the case facts for these cases, I can send them to you in the chat. But uh, we, have, we have a few more to go through. We have a few more things to go through before we go stand by, right? So I'm going to go through and at the end of the session, right? If you want me to go back and get the case off for you guys, I can send it in the group, all right? Proper delegation of power now, right? In essence, specifically, right? Proper improper delegation or of power, right? Refers to the transfer or decision making authority, right? From one entity to another in a manner that exceeds the scope of the authority granted by the law or is inconsistent with constitutional principles, right? So in judicial review, improper delegation of power may occur when a legislative body delegates right, its lawmaking authority to an administrative agency or other non-elected entities beyond what is permitted by the constitution. So you delegate power to somebody who cannot exercise the power. That is the improper delegation of power, right? So we have that there, we're supposed to discuss that, right? The main case here is Sutherland versus Groves 1874, right? With the main um, road law, right here. So we have that case there. It's a pretty small case. So what basically occurred here, the main road law, what it would have done is provided main roads, right? And provided um, that when main roads were encroached upon by any building, the director of roads could by notice, right? To the encroacher or the, the removal of the speci by a specified time right so any building that was encroaching on a main road right the director of roads could actually just you know tell them you know that they need to you know remove it by a specified time right if it was not removed the director of roads could remove it right at the owner's cost a notice was signed by an office of the department and not the director of roads so notice now that that is so that is um, some amount of procedural ultra-virus there. The director of the ro of roads had the power to had the power to delegate, right? Well, not the power to delegate, the power to use, right? But the power was delegated improperly to a member, an officer of the department who did not have the power to chat to um to actually do this, right? So we have that there procedural ultra-virus, and that happened in Southern versus Groves, eighteen seventy four. Right, the improper delegation of power. Alright. So that was occurring there. And in abuse of discretion now, right? In abuse of discretion now, we're looking at the fact that when um decision makers exercise their discretion in a manner that is arbitrary, capricious, or unresponsible. Right? So we're looking at the abuse of the power. It's basically an abuse of power. In judicial review, courts examine whether a decision maker has acted within the bounds of their authority and has considered relevant factors in making the decision. So did you actually make a decision within your rights? And did you think about the consequences before you have made this decision? Right? Before you just acted capriciously and just did this? Right? There can be an abuse of discretion. Patterson versus AG, right? Bradshaw versus Fowler. White Church versus Co uh, and Co Limited versus the Attorney General Williams Construction Limited versus the Attorney General Barbados, as well as uh, um, within the fun public functionary given discretion, we have Bolin versus the Attorney General and Camacho, Camacho versus the well and Sons rather versus the Col Customs Collective. Right, well, a lot of cases for this. So abuse of discretion, we usually use Patterson versus the Attorney General. Right, so we generally use Patterson. 
this case, right? The governor in council, right, had power to authorize the attorney general to acquire lands compulsorily to enable a company to build a railway terminal. Okay. The attorney general exercised this delegated power to compulsory acquire lands to enable the railway company to build residences and a chapel for private benefit of its employees. The power granted, right, was well had been intended to cover a railway terminal. So you so yes, he had the power to de delegate where the railway terminal was going to go, but he used that not only for the railway terminal, but to provide building residences and a chapel. That was overstating his power. That was not what the power was there to do. It was only given, right, for him to acquire lands for a railway terminal. Not to build residences and a chapel. Not to do anything else but a railway terminal. So we see the ultra-virus there in Patterson versus AG. With the abuse of discretion, he abused his power. His power was to create the, uh, the railway terminal, not to create any other structure. Right? Really, really simple there. Right? As it relates to White Church and William Constructions, that's basically based on that's based on mm, 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 statutory power. Right? We're looking at something like that. So it's generally the same thing, Arun there. They have the same ring to it with their ultravirus, right? So the cases are there. Right, with a public functionary giving description now, right? Where a public functionary was given description may not restrict or fetter his discretion. The law exempts, right, that a public functionary will approach the decision making process with an open mind. We're looking at that. So we can see the Barbadian case of Bolden versus the AG, right? Um, and Camcho and Sons versus the Customs Collector. So those two cases are pretty, pretty important as it relates to public functionary giving discussion. All right. Yet again, after the discussion, if you want to go back, if you want to note on the case that you want the case law for, I can provide it to you. All right. Now, local standi, now, we know that local standi speaks to standing to sue, right? So the standing that somebody has to appear before a court, right? The, there must be some amount of involvement by the individual. Right, there must be some amount of involvement by the individual for them to bring the matter to court. Right? So it can't it can't be a situation in which a situation can occur and you are not affected by it and you bring the matter to court. That can't happen. The matter must affect you in some way, shape or form. It must right affect you in some way, shape or form for you to have the power or the standing to appear in court with the with the matter. Right? So parties directly affected by the legal dispute have access to the court system. Parties that are not directly affected do not have access to the court system. Right? So that's what we're looking at though. They, they, they prevent any type of frivolous or vexatious litigation. Right? So the key principles are the protection of judicial resources. So by making sure that only persons with standing can actually bring a court case, it provides um, some amount of protection to the judicial resources. Right? We know it takes money to actually drive litigation. So you can't have any and anybody coming coming forward with a court case, right? Only the persons that have standing. So it leads to only relevant litigation and it prevents any type of unnecessary or irrelevant litigation. It also promotes adversarial proceed proceedings. Local standards help to maintain the adversarial nature of legal proceedings by ensuring that cases are brought before the court by parties with a genuine, genuine stake in the outcome. This promotes the presentation of conflicting arguments and evidence, which is essential for our fair and impartial resolution of disputes. We can't have disputes that are both supporting or both negative, no. Right? It must be adversarial in nature, that is the nature of litigation. And we have the protection of rights as well. Local standard protects the rights of parties by ensuring that their interests are adequately represented in court. It allows the parties those rights have been violated and whose interests have been adversely affected to seek redress, right? Nobody else. Right? We have R versus Mbafeno, 1966. That is the key case that we can look at here. Right? What occurred, in, this is a Trinidadian case, right? Um, 
which occurred with an issue with the Commission of Inquiry Ordinance in Trinidad, right? So that is a key case there. So please read up on the case law for those things, right? We have two different approaches to, to local standi, by the way. We have the liberal and the restrictive approach, right? Which Fiajo, Professor Fiajo was a person that really spoke about these two cases, right? Right, so it emphasizes the importance of striking a balance between the liberal and restrictive approaches of standing. He acknowledges that the need for broad access to the court system, right, ensure accountability to protect individual rights, but also recognizes the risk of opening the floodgates to frivolous litigation. Fiajo advocates for the nuanced approach that allows litiga um, legitimate rather, claims to proceed while preventing abuse of the legal system. Right? So we can't just have any and anybody having the power to go towards the, the court system. Right? Because you're going to have a lot of unnecessary cases. Right? So that can happen when you have a liberal approach. But if you have a restrictive approach now, you restrict the amount of, you could restrict even um, some persons who may be affected. Right? So looking here, the case law. For the liberal approach to local standard, you must look at Payne versus the Attorney General of, of St. Kitts. Right? For the restrictive approach, you must look at Richards and James versus the Attorney General of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Or we can look at Pierre versus Redhead, 1993. If you want to look at a case that has both approaches and compares them, you must look at Blake v. Bryson, 1994. Right? And if you look at the matters of public interest now, giving rise to standing, so looking at here now, right? So if the matter itself didn't really have the standing um, being given out to certain persons, right? But it is a matter of public interest, it may give rise to standing to the state. So the state may gain standing, right? So if it affects the overall public interest, it becomes public law and no longer private law. So the state gains standing. And this is exemplified within R versus state for foreign affairs ex parte world development movement limited 1995 and these are our cases all right and that brings us to the end of our module two review directly at two o'clock so we started at what 10 um at 9 30 10 30 i think 10 30 all right and we ended at two okay so those are the cases the case laws and stuff like that right so here's where i will now um ask you guys now the case laws that you need i want you guys to tell me the cases that you guys don't have the law the facts for 